You're listening to The Western Rookie, a hunting podcast full of tips, tricks, and strategies from seasoned Western hunters. There are plenty of opportunities out there. We just need to learn how to take on the challenges. Hunting is completely different up there. I've harvested 26 big game animals. You can fool their eyes, but you can't fool their nose. The 300 yards back to the road turned into three miles back the other way. It's always cool seeing new hunters go and harvest an animal. I don't know what to expect. If there's anybody I want in the woods with me, it'll be you. Welcome back to another Western Rookie Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Krebs, and this show is brought to you by Go Hunt. Today, I have Brooke Danier on the phone call. Hopefully, I got that right. I just learned how to pronounce your last name, and I don't want to butcher it. So, But, Brooke, how are you doing today? You're traveling back from Wisconsin to Michigan. Um, so yeah. is your home base in Michigan or is your home base in Idaho? Um, my, well, I grew up in Wisconsin. My home base is in Idaho, but um, I kind of came home for the holidays visiting some friends. My boyfriend actually lives in Michigan, so that's kind of why I'm here for Christmas with his family. So, Oh, awesome. So you're doing all kinds of traveling. Um, and you said you just wrapped up with another outfitting season. So were you guiding in Wisconsin too or just wrapped up in Idaho? I was just wrapping up in Idaho. Perfect. Awesome. So any, any like crazy events happen this year? Was it a pretty low key year? Like things go as planned. Um, I mean, I killed my first archery bull elk. Like my, I didn't kill it myself, but it was my first guided kill with archery. Oh, that was pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to feel, I mean, I, that's got to feel like almost the same as shooting it yourself because when you're, when you're the caller on an archery setup, like you're doing 95% of the work. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it was a huge accomplishment. I've been trying to do it for three or four years now and finally all came together and the hard work pays off in the end. Really. It's, it's really rewarding when you put that much work and effort in. So yeah, one of the bigger events. And my, one of my issues is um, just like knowing when I'm calling for someone else, there's so much more pressure to me than if I'm the shooter. Like when my brother calls, I'm like, all right, my job is to like sit here, be quiet, be still, find the elk, get a shot. Like, right. That's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. When I'm calling for him, I'm like, I don't know what he wants me to do. Like, should I, should we like get more intense? Should we get more aggressive? Should we back off? Should I try to like call myself out of those situation and try to bring that bull in or should we move towards him you know and you can like listen to the elk and kind of see what they're saying but a lot of times in general units and like highly pressured areas they're not super vocal it seems like they don't just give you everything right right so. yeah and the conditions i had that week were like we got lucky honestly because it was like 30 mile an hour winds and we're in a deadfall so trees are falling left and right every whistle that comes through the tree sounds like a bugle so it gets really frustrating we got that time frame about four five hours where it was no wind and finally got it done so that's crazy we almost had a tree fall on one of our people this year he was napping under a tree for like an hour and he woke up and he looked and he's like that tree looks dead Uh i'm gonna move and like 10 minutes later it fell down that's crazy yeah no we're in all deadfall basically so like that's that's what kind of what we have to watch for and we're also hiking over all the deadfall too so it makes it challenging yeah that's the worst um i think hiking through deadfall is my least favorite part of all of elk hunting like if you could pick one thing to get rid of i would pick no more deadfall yeah it's, yeah that and brush brush doesn't even bother me as much as the deadfall does because you just can't make progress like yeah. Like if you're trying to, we had it one time where we had a bull bugle at like 300 and then we, he bugled again at 150. So we thought we had tons of time, like perfect 300 yards. Like we have enough time to like figure out a setup. And then he had bugled at 150, like 10 seconds later. So he was like on the move. Oh, and yeah. so we we're like, Oh, we need to go up fast for the thermals. And so we take off running and we hit deadfall in like four steps and both tripped. And then the bull was there. And so <laughs> it just, it's like, you oh, can't no. move. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've been in that situation also myself, but what do, do you, you do? Have you ever seen like, like deadfall where it's 100% deadfall? It almost looks like, like a flood of timber and like the whole oh. mountain is just open. Like there's no tree standing at all. It looks like a lake of trees. 
Yeah, that hap that actually happened to me when I got to the bottom of where we go hunting. I had no idea I was at the bottom, and it was a rock slide of trees. It was crazy. But we found our way out, and obviously down, but it was definitely a pain in the butt. We did that once, kind of by Idaho, the closest we've ever hunted to Idaho. And the trees were so big, and they were, like, stacked over each other, like, sometimes three or four high, that we yeah. just jumped up on the trees and just started running, like, trees down. And then we'd, like, get to a cross and jump onto the next one and go that, you know, like, zigzag our way across. We just ran across the top of the trees because they were, like, eight feet over the ground. Like, I'll, yeah. I don't know what happened. It was, it must have been a tornado or something. Yeah. No, that's, that's kind of what I do now where we're at is just jump trees. <laughs> Yeah. Are you uh, the right height to go under them too? Like the paint, like the ones that are like half and half, like I'm tall. So I usually go over them, but sometimes it's like really a pain in the butt if they're like at my chest. I normally try and go over them because my pack is too bulky on me, but I can fit <laughs> underneath them most of the time. Okay. I'm only five foot four, so it works. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That's my wife is the same height as you. And I think we're going to find, we have, we're going to have to like pick a speed to walk. Cause my brother's like five ten, and even he'll notice it. Like my stride is so much bigger than his that like, if we get snow or going over deadfall, like I can go a lot faster through that than he can. And so I'm going to, I'm guessing my wife's going to be like, will you slow down? Like I have oh, to, yeah. I have to jump up on these logs and climb over them and you just step over them in stride. <laughs> so yeah, we're doing our first Western hunt next year, but um, it's just antelope. So hopefully we don't have any deadfall to cross. Nice. Fun. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. So what species do you guys guide for? I'm assuming elk and mule deer are probably the prime, like the primary uh, two. Elk, mule deer, and bear. Oh, bear. in the spring bear or fall bear? Uh, we do both. I used to guide in the spring bear and then help out in the fall, but fall is really busy for between horses and packing into camps with elk season and whatnot. So yeah. Well, that's a perfect transition because I really wanted to talk hunting with horses. So this show is pretty much, I would say it's a majority of Midwestern hunters, probably whitetail hunters that go out West, like DIY, I would imagine. But obviously, you know, hunting with a guide, I think it would, if I could afford it every year, I think it would be a lot of fun. Like, it's nice to do things on your own, but I'm not opposed to like, going with people that know what they're doing as well. And so that's always been an interest of me is like a horse trip. I don't know what the proper term for it is, but going in on a team of horses to a dedicated camp and then like getting up every morning, getting on a horse and hunting, you know, out of camp even further in. Than, right. Right. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like from the beginning, like what does it take to set up a camp of that scale? Like, I know my dad's done a hunt where he said like they left the trailhead with like 40 horses. Yeah. See, okay. So the, the company that I work for Hell's Canyon Outfitters based out of Riggins. Um, we have about 75 horses, horses, not all our horses. We have mules. A lot of them are mules. We have like maybe eight horses, but basically we'll take our camp. So the camp that I'm in, um, we have four camps, a tack tent, a guide tent, cook tent and your client tent and okay. the cook and client tent is combined but it takes about 12 mules to get everything in and then three or four people will stay overnight and set it up and then come out the next day um and we'll pack all of our hay in prior to that so a lot of the work comes between pre-season so a week before opening day and then you'll have your packers that are bringing in hay and supplies for your guides that need everything throughout the season um we'll the guides will kill an elk and we'll hang the meat in camp and we'll call our boss be like hey um we need somebody to come in we have the meat at camp it's, it's got to get out it's kind of hot it's sometimes in the beginning of the season it's 75 80 degrees up there right. so it can be challenging um so that's where the horses come in um we'll take the horses from our base camp out to a certain area bugle and we'll tie our horses up to a certain spot and hike down to wherever we think we can get. Um, Cause our camp is 12 miles in. So wow. you can, you can go out six miles and you can get on that horse and save yourself some of that work. So you can go in that steep country. And a lot of it is deadfall. Um, the guides and I, when we work together, we started out doing miles and now we kind of say that we crossed about 800 trees today instead of four miles or whatnot but <laughs> it's 
so it became a a little jumping theme of hiking really yeah so are do you, you said you use a lot like a majority are actually mules not Correct. horses is yep. that because they're more sure-footed yeah there's okay. just i mean it, i guess it's a, everybody has their own perspective and preference on horses and mules i like mules and it's probably because that's what i started out on um but i think they're more trustworthy okay. and they remember a lot so i could come back in 10 years from now and they'd be like hey that's that girl that rode me in 2019 or whatnot and they would remember you oh that's pretty cool yeah so when you said you have four camps like you have four camps and each camp has four tents or does did you mean this like camp has four different tents? sorry i messed that we only have so elk season we have two backcountry camps and our archery camp has four tents and then we'll cross over into the rifle season and then the other camp will have three tents oh okay that makes yep. sense so how much do you have to bring in to support the horses like obviously you got to be close to water that's huge right but ju- the f- because horses like are different than for like the llamas a lot of people are really getting into llamas and and yep. um alpacas because they can um they do better on foraging especially if there's good grass or good feed on the mountain um they don't require to bring in as much, but for a horse, I mean, obviously they'll probably eat some grass, but right. it's not going to be enough. Right. Right. So where we're at, it's like a, a burn really. It gets so hot in that Canyon that it just burns all the grass off and it's just yellow. So mm. when we get up so there, nothing. they'll kind of graze on their way in, but we'll give them hay. We'll, we'll pack in hay, um, probably 80 to 90 bales for that entire season. And it all just depends on how many hunters we have. So we'll, one week we could have four hunters in and another week we could have four hunters and three non-hunters in there. So that's seven horses right there, plus all your guide horses. So it's kind right. of every year is different based on the amount of guides, the people that are in there, your cook. And you got to go off of each day, too. So if we if we tag out early, we will have extra hay in there. But it really just depends on how many people are in there and who's willing to ride out and who's not riding out, but we'll take cob in there too. So that's like a molasses and corn mixture just to kind of help stabilize their weight and a little treat for them too. Right. So, yeah, that's gotta be a lot more dense than right. Like, yeah. So 80 to 90 bales. I'm assuming like these are small squares. So they're correct. Yep. Depends how dry they are, but like 60 pounds on average. Yeah, 65, 70. Okay, so could a horse pack four bales? Or like, how do you get them in there? So that's why I'm starting to figure this out. Like, it seems like it's a lot of logistics. Right, and it is. So, I mean, if you wanted to, you could. A lot of people don't prefer to do that because it's it's stressful on the horse and mule itself. So each side of the pack saddle has to have the same amount of weight on each side or you're gonna roll that saddle and cause a wreck so it's only it's either two or four like those are your options not really no you can go by weight so we only do two so one on each side right so if you wanted to take 16 bales you need eight horses yeah so for i mean 90 bales you need 45 trips with a horse like whether you do that you know fives or ten i mean obviously you're not doing it with one horse but Right. So that's like somebody's job for like a week is just going right. back and forth with hay bales. Yep. And we, we normally try before we get in there with all the clients. We're like our team together, the clients – or not the clients, excuse me, the guides and the packers and everybody that we work with kind of get together like, okay, here we go. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get camping. We need 12 meals. Here's what we're going to take. And three people are going to stand. The people that come out are going to manny those bales up, and we're going to go in the next day, and they're going to come out. So okay. it's kind of an increment. We'll, we try and get at least half of them in there before the season starts. Yeah, because you're going to come out and pick up new clients, drop clients off. Right. Like if there's ever a spare horse, you could bring in some more. Right. Yep. Yeah. I'm an engineer, so I'm always like, man, it seems like, you know, I'm always trying to find better ways to do things than the people that have been doing it their entire life. And I'm obviously right. 
usually you don't, right? The people that do it have it figured out. But I'm like, man, I wonder how easy it would be to, with a helicopter to just come in and drop yeah. a bunch of bales. But then I'm like, yeah, it'd be really easy after a million dollars for a helicopter or whatever right. it and, cost. Yeah, and Idaho doesn't let you use anything like mechanical for hunting reasons or their rules in Idaho. Really? I forget what they call it. Yeah, so you like people that hunt with GoPros mounted on their bows, it's illegal. You can't use um, mechanical broadheads all stuff like that red dots are illegal for certain animals like big in like elk and bear right i'm not sure if they're legal or not in like using wolves or hunting wolves and like predators i'm not really sure yeah yeah that's a good question i mean i know you can use like optics with rifles like i don't it seems like a mechanical broadhead versus like a 25 power scope like one of them gives you a much more you know, better chance than the other. I'm just saying, I mean, I don't hunt mechanicals anyway for elk, but yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, Yeah. everything's the old fashioned way, which is probably good. I mean, at the end of the day, that's probably good. Yeah. It makes it interesting. Yeah. Sometimes you're probably like, man, this is kind of silly. Like I wish I could have a lighted knock so I could see where my impact is. Right. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's probably the best to like keep Idaho the way it is really. And right. Not turn it into some of these other states. (laughs) Wow. So did you grow up around horses and mules and like, that's what gravitated towards this career or like, where was the beginning where you're like, I want to be an outfitter. Uh, when I was 14 and went on my first elk hunt with my dad, uh, I never grew up by horses or anything. I just, I grew up hunting all the time with my brother and my dad. They're the ones that really taught me everything that I know between hunting. And then we kind of went on this hunt and I said, this is what I want to do. And my dad's like, you know, it's not just, killing stuff you gotta cook clean pack everything in and out you gotta process and i was kind of like okay that's a lot of work like i don't live on that but i was 14 so and i i just when i got in high school i started applying for jobs out west because i grew up on a farm with cattle and everything and uh kind of want to do the ranching type thing but i didn't have any horse experience so out of like the 200 ranches that i applied for they all said no so i started applying for criminal justice and my dad found out that I was going to go to college to be a cop and told me no and started searching online for me to learn about horses and sent me to a horse camp after I looked into it, learned how to basically call and recognize um, tracks and everything, learned how to ride a horse, saddle a horse, all the basics, Okay. Um, got my wilderness first aid and that's really where it all started. Wow. That's a, that's a story. So he just yeah. was not about the police officer life. Nope. I graduated high school in 2019. So I was 18 and that was when the whole protesting Riots, George yeah. Floyd thing was going on. And it was just, and nowadays everybody says law enforcement is risky, so they don't recommend it. They love it, but they're trying to get out of it too. Well, so. I think, a, yeah. And a huge part of it's where you're at. I mean, right. Like for you, if you were a law enforcement agent out, you know, near Riggins or wherever you are in Idaho, like that's very different than if you were like in Chicago or like Minneapolis now would be a disaster. That's just in my backyard. So I think that's a huge part of it, too. But it's hard. I mean, that's another life that takes a lot. Yeah. So a lot less, it's certainly less excitement when guns start going off than what you do now. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Big difference. (laughs) Yeah. Big difference. Um, okay. Well, that's kind of funny. You said that. Cause we met the last time we were archery hunting in Montana, we met this cowboy and he was a hired hand of the ranch and he was just summering in our, I don't know, Canyon, you know, so he just stayed up there four days a week and watched the cows and doctored anything that needed it. And then he'd go home for like two, three days, you know, get more food and then go back up in. And it was like three hours to get in there. So it was, you know, a long ways. But he started out, he went to Rhodes University for finance, got a finance job, hated it, started bartending instead. He's like, well, this is like, is this life? Like, who wants to, you know, be a bartender for 40 years? Right. She's like, I want to be a cowboy. So he sold everything, bought a truck and four horses and went out west. And I don't know how he got, he got a job in Colorado. He must not I think the story is he knew how to ride, like his mom signed him up for lessons as a kid and stuff and he stuck with it so like he knew how to ride a horse but that was the extent of his cowboying huh. and so some ranch gave him a job maybe they're short and then he was you know moved to this montana ranch but he was young too like he was 
I mean, probably a little older than you, but he'd been doing it like three seasons and, you know, it was pretty evident he was still learning. <laughs> oh yeah, for, for sure. You're learning every single day. He would show up. There's like this one great spot to glass. And so we'd glass if we ever got back with daylight just to see where the elk were. And the day they pushed the cattle out, he was, he's telling him about it the night before, like, Hey, we're going to push cattle. There's a bunch of cowboys coming in. You know, I'm really hopeful we'll get it on the first try, but you know, usually you have to re-ride all week and get the, you know, strays or the ones that, you know, you didn't get the first pass. So he gets back that night and we're glassing already. And we're like, well, we were all like, he didn't get them on the first try. Cause there's like six over there and 12 over there and five over there. And, you know, cause we got spotting scopes where we're looking for elk. So it's easy to find all these cattle. And he comes up, he's like, I think we got them all. And we're like, uh, well, we found like 30. Like, <laughs> oh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's a character, but it's a, like, I was just, I'm always interested when people make like, I don't know, to me, it seems like a, like a super crazy choice. Like I'm going to go from yeah. finance to cowboying or yeah. from police officer to outfitter, you know? Yeah. So I assume you yeah. like the, the way it worked out. I enjoy it. I mean, it was something I always wanted to do. I never really wanted to go to college. I said that when I was, I don't know, in the eighth grade too, because I mean, what 18 year old really knows what they're going to want to do. And I didn't want to waste my money for something that I maybe will do and yeah, then go guide and not make the money to pay it off. So, right. Yeah. You could have went to criminal justice school and still end up as a outfitter or a guide. Exactly. So you yeah. never know. Um, one of the questions that I I feel like you might get, and I don't want to offend you, but when people find out that their guide is a younger girl, did they ever get weird? Yeah, I've had a few. Then I've had like, a few, but... Oh, you're the guide? Like, where's yep. the... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which isn't right. I mean, there's people that, you know, could be 14-year-old girls in Idaho that know more about hunting than, you know, Jim yeah. Zumbo or, or um, you know, anyone, like there's it doesn't really matter who you are you know what your age is I'm just I'm picturing like when someone books an elk guide they might have an idea in their mind and then they show up and they're like oh and I'm just wondering like is it ever like super awkward or people just get over it as soon as you're like yeah I know what I'm doing like this is um some people yeah I've had a few like that but I've also learned to kind of brush it off and if they can't respect me then we're just gonna go for a really long hike until you do um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a good method. <laughs> I've had I had a client like that this year, and he was just saying how he didn't want to be with uh, a certain person because he couldn't walk, or this person because he was really young, and then going to my boss because I didn't know what I was doing. It's just like, okay, well then we're gonna go for a hike, and we may see a bull, and you're gonna like they said they wanted to go on a hike, but I'm like, listen, there's a really nice bull down here. Like, why do we have to leave a bull to go find another one? Oh yeah, so I'm like. Okay, if you don't want it, then you don't deserve it. We're just going to, we're going to go for a nice hike until you can figure out how to respect everybody else that works here. Because, I mean, if you went on a guided hunt, you can't really tell your guide what you want to do. We're open for suggestions and whatnot, but in the end, I think everybody that I work with at that outfit has been there since 2019. So we know the country and we're very confident and we all work together really well. So if we have questions, we come together and um, right. basically ask what they want to do and then we're going to be like okay we'll put it together and this is where we're going to go right well and i feel like the time to be picky about what kind of hunt you want is when you're looking at guides correct like if you want like for someone that wants to hike a lot like why'd you book a guide that uses horses right right like and there's a lot of guides out there like there's probably a guide for every style of hunting and i feel like that's when you can be picky but like right. when i book a guide if, well, not when I've never done it, but if I picked a guided hunt, it'd either be like, because it allowed me to hunt a tag I wouldn't otherwise be able to get like a landowner tag or, you know, some type of outfitter tag. Mm -hmm. And I want, like, I want this tag. It's a really good hunt, you know, and the only, or like Canada, perfect example. Like if you want to hunt Canada, you have to use a guide. So that's right. the one thing. And then, you know, in every situation, it would be like, well, I also want to hunt with people that know the area, they know the animals, they like, they know more about this than I do. Like, that's right. why you have a guide. So I wouldn't be like, oh, this is how you elk hunt. It's like, well, I'm here yeah. to learn from you how you guys elk hunt this area. Right. Maybe I elk hunt different. 
where I've other hunted other places, but that doesn't really apply. Like I can't bring my North Dakota elk hunting experience to Idaho because it's right. You know, yeah, completely different landscape. Yep. And yeah, and I'm only 23 too. And I like, I'd like to say I know everything, but I don't, I'm always listening. Like I've had clients, my very first bull that I ever killed, uh, the guy was hunting with me cause he wanted to go in the area, didn't know the area. And I was like, okay, well, if, do you guys like hiking? They're like, yeah, we prefer to, if we kill a bull, just hike it out, not use horses. And I was like, okay. Cause I really enjoy hiking. I actually would rather hike than take horses because I just worry about them running away. The one time I did take horses, my horse bit its lead rope off and ran back to camp. So I had to walk back anyway. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it was just a nuisance to me, but I love them. They, they help a lot. Um, I guess I just, I can't just not take advice from other people when my clients come in and they have a good idea i'm like oh that's i never thought of that we should try that and like i'm willing to listen and learn still but i also don't appreciate when others are disrespectful to everybody else when we're the guides yeah and if it's anything like i've observed in like almost every other aspect of life like the people that have the loudest criticism are usually not in front of you on whatever path you're on Like, I would imagine, like, for you, the people that are, like, stone-cold killers, like, they've shot 100 bulls, they know they've done DIY their entire life, and maybe mixing a couple guides, like, they show up to camp to have a fun time, like, they probably don't tell you what to do or how to do things, like, they're just, you know, they might say, hey, you know, what about this, but, like, everyone that's ever been in front of me on a journey has always, like, been a lot more respectful than, like, all the criticism I get from anything is always from the rear view. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Me too. Right. Like the people that would maybe show up to camp, like telling you how to do your job. It's like maybe their first elk hunt for a stereotype, yeah. yep. you know? Yep. I get it a lot, but I'm, I think I grew out of it and I know how to handle it myself. And if I can't do it, then I just go to my boss and he handles it. Otherwise the other guides, cause I'm the only female guide in that outfit. We have like female cooks and everything, but I feel like I get the grunt of a lot of it just cause I'm a young female guiding big game in a man's industry um it is what it is yeah yeah it's funny because like i don't know there's a lot of guys out there that like wouldn't be any more qualified like i wouldn't be any more qualified i lose my temper super easy when things don't work out in the elk woods like that's not a good characteristic as a for a guy when a you know when somebody does something wrong and the the setup gets blown and, and you like just want to lash out like that's usually not right the recipe for a successful review on google <laughs> yeah yeah so i'd probably be a terrible guide um but yeah it's just funny how people's i don't know ego gets in the way probably is what it really comes down to yeah which has nothing to do with you like it their ego has right. nothing to do with all the work you've put in learning and being there so yeah, I feel like a lot of people that go on guided hunts think that it's always guaranteed to kill an elk, which, I mean, it's called hunting for a reason. I like to say my clients should come out with a really good attitude, want to have fun, and the more fun that you have, I mean, we're we're going to have opportunities. We're going to see elk. If you don't get those conditions, then, I mean, it's hunting. Yeah, but one archery yeah, hunting, too for your early season stuff like that's hard no matter what like you could do your job to a t and call in a bull to 20 yards and there's still no shot like you might be in black timber and he can't like we've had that many times we went to a hunt in wyoming there were seven of us we had 30 i can't remember if it was 33 or 39 encounters under 60 yards just you know you're kind of guessing like you hear enough bugles in a week, you can kind of start to be like, well, that one's really close, like 40, 50, 60 yards. They're yeah. like, nah, that one's over 100. We yep. had 30 some of them under 60, and we had two shot opportunities. Yep. Yeah. It, I had a bull at 20, I called the bull into 20 yards from one of my buddies. He's like, I can see its, and that's how we know, because he's like, I could see its antlers. It's the only thing he could see. I mean, yeah. it was that thick, and it's like, what do you do? Like, he did everything. Like, it's hard to get him to even into 20. What do you need? Like, Imagine yeah. calling him into five yards for someone like it's a huge yeah. mountain, like it's no really kidding. tricky. And I'm sure there's people out there that do it consistently. But yeah, it's it's yeah. tough no matter what. It's fun, though. It, it makes for good memories. I had 
uh, actually a guy that I worked with, he's from Mexico. He was just helping out and kind of learning how to guide because he wanted to start his own consulting business. Um, and he brought his dad out and he was videoing everything and uh, called this bull and we were at the bottom, the very bottom and called this bull and we we're like, okay, he won't come in any closer. And so we sit down and start having lunch and I just kind of stand up, stretch my legs. And I'm like, oh boy. And I looked at Lucas and I was like, no, put it away. That bull was 80 yards. And the only reason why he, he sounded like he was 300, because he was in thick timber next to water. So it was holding mm. that sound down. Yeah. So I threw out a cow call and he looked up, but we were on this bench and he knew there was no cow there. So, cause he couldn't see anything. So he was right. kind of nervous. Um, and his dad could shoot at 80 yards. It was just not a good shot. So that's, yeah, it's tough. Um, yeah. I've had to not shoot. I've not shot four bulls within 60 yards because of the shot and it. Like every time we go out West, I'm just thinking about every one of those shot opportunities. It's like, <laughs> I had two of them this year at 60. One was yeah. just full frontal. All I could see was its head though. Like I couldn't even see the, the cavity and I'm yeah. not taking it. I'm not the archer to take a 60 yard frontal shot. Yeah. And the other one was 58 in broadside, but there's a tree that went to like the liver. So I would have had like worse than a liver shot, which yeah. that's not a recipe for success either. So I just, yeah. Like, what do you do? You know, if, if the tree's close, yeah, you can like lean, but it was yeah. like right next to the elks. I would have had to walk over like 20 yards to get a better angle <laughs> and that's not going to work. So yeah, gosh, that's tough. Like it just, it stinks getting that close to something that's that hard and then not being able to seal the deal. Yeah. But it's hunting. It makes it yeah. fun. It is hunting. That is for sure. And so you do, you said archery elk do you do archery mule deer in the same camp or is that really not popular? No, we don't really do much any of archery mule deer. Yeah. We just do rifle. Okay. And then um, you do the rifle bear, rifle elk, rifle mule deer. Correct. On the rifle hunts, is that a lot more like using horses daily as a part of the hunting to cover more ground? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We'll use more horses during uh, rifle season. The elk tend to move a lot further away from camp and there's we run into a little bit more people than we'd like to see back there but um so that's where the horses come in nice we can get further away from people and get to different spots where they couldn't in a day so yeah what's your favorite thing what's your favorite like hunt to guide uh archery elk archery elk just because they're yep. vocal and you can get close and adrenaline gets crazy yeah yeah well that's my favorite that's my favorite to hunt too but I am looking forward, like, there's something about having a rifle in your pack when the time yeah. comes. Like, archery's cool, but I would rather have a rifle when the time comes. And Yeah. And it's just something about a rifle hunt. Maybe it's, like, the colder weather and the more of the, like, camp, you know, deer camp, elk camp. Yeah. You know, I don't know, scene, vibrate, vibe, yeah. whatever it is. But it's just nice. And especially for mule deer. I'm kind of on a mule deer kick. I want to do more mule deer hunting. and. I don't know if my spot and stock skills coming from a tree stand in the Midwest are going to be <laughs> up to par for a, you know, archery mule deer hunt. So yeah. I'm, I'm thinking I've done three with a rifle, probably do another one or two with the rifle and then maybe switch to bow and trying to do some of that stuff too. Yeah. You do it enough. You get used to it. I came from the same kind of thing you're doing right now, sitting in a tree stand in Wisconsin and now I'm hiking mountains and spot and stock and elk and mule deer. So. Have you but. been since, so you said you started in 2019 and you've, so you've been with this outfit for set the whole time. Yes. Except for what was it? 2022 season. I went to Alaska and packed for a moose camp there. And then I came back this past season. So packed, like put moose on your backpack and walked them out. Uh, we used horses too, oh, but we did, have one, we did have one scenario. We had to pack the moose on foot to a certain spot to get the horses there. That was that's gotta be uh, awful. They're they're huge. <laughs> yeah. Well, so because big. Alaska also has laws about deboning meat, right? Like you have to bring the quarters out bone in. It's, um, I, I think that I mean you can debone it, but you have to have every piece of meat, every neck meat. meat, everything. I knew that. They like rib meat. You have to take the rib meat. You have to take all like yeah. the shanks and everything. The neck meat. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think there's any laws on organs. I'm not sure. I've never hunted in Oregon. <laughs> no, like, like you don't have to take like the oh. liver, or you don't have to oh, take oh, like, yeah, the yeah, heart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I but don't yeah, do have to take so. the tenderloins. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that would if you can debone it, then it's just how much, how many trips you want to make. But I was thinking if you had to like carry a rear quarter of a big bull moose out bone in like that's got to be on the other side of a hundred for sure oh 100 percent. it's heavy and alaska's not dry by any means yeah every i've heard people say the worst part is like every step you sink like four inches yep and yeah. so i yeah, bet that... the quarter that i carried was at least 120 to 150 the, so you did you did a quarter bone in, was yeah. it a front or a rear? I think I did a front and a rear. It was me and one other girl that was helping move the meat because the guide was bringing everything from one spot to us, and then we'd take it to another spot because we didn't know where the where he had killed the bull, and it was in a bunch of willows, so he was doing the hard part. Oh jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that does get heavy. I mean it's heavy for me, and I'm six two. Like I'm a bigger person i've the heaviest i've ever packed out was 146 not including the frame um i did a elk rear and an elk front at the same time and then i got back to my house and i weighed them and the rears were 82 and the fronts were 64 and so and that was a huge elk i mean it was a 350 inch bull yeah. eight and a half years old so when people talk about like 100 pound elk quarters i'm like eh, i've never seen yeah. one maybe a yeah. big rosy you know, like a Fontenac yeah. Island Roosevelt elk might have a hundred pound quarters. Yeah. But I've never seen a, like a, you know, the, <laughs> with all due respect, the raghorn you shot did not have a hundred pound quarters <laughs> to whoever, right. you know, to whoever says like, Oh, is that a hundred pound quarters? I'm like, mm, right. Good for right. you. Happy for you. <laughs> I don't say anything, yeah. but it's, they're not the, I don't think the elk are as heavy as people like to give them credit for Cause it sounds cool when you say you did a hundred pound pack out. I think moose are probably the opposite. Like they're way heavier than you're hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you're hiking uphill with the elk quarter, it feels like a hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. I like to shoot mine above camp and then yeah. bring them downhill. I've done yeah. that. Both of my pack outs have been the easiest pack outs ever. Um, I've probably packed out six or seven elk. None of them were terrible, but the one year I didn't go cause I was in college. My brother shot an elk like three miles in and that was like an all night pack out on that one yeah so it gets so it gets busy with the pack out but i'm guessing most of the time when you guys shoot elk especially elk but anything with horses in camp you try to line up for a horse extraction right yep yeah yep most so, of the time we'll walk back to camp and get two horses otherwise some of us have radios that we can radio uh the people in camp to saddle the horses and kind of meet us we'll send them a garmin Oh, and reach the yeah. point and they'll bring it to us um but half the time that doesn't work so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i suppose so what does it look like on your like when you're rifle hunting and you're using the horses more day in day out so i assume everything starts early because you want to get out there early yep. but are you as the outfitter or the guide doing all of like the horse chores or because i'm guessing you probably don't want clients saddling their own horses no, we uh, all the glide, all the guides do all the horse chores. We feed them, saddle them, water them. Their okay. their pen is right in with water. Um, yeah. So all of the guides and if the cook is able to, they'll help out and do whatever. But we try not to have the clients do it unless if we know them personally and they work with horses. It's just we only have so many mules and horses that are riders and packers. And once they're sword, they're sword for about a good two weeks. Okay. So, so, so yeah. And you like, there's a lot of ways to mess up putting a saddle on, right? Like if you don't know what you're doing, you'll probably mess it up. Yeah. Yep. So your client just all of a sudden falls off because the saddle isn't set up. Right. right. I feel like right. that's a disaster. That's a big liability. I mean, yeah. So do you ever have clients that have like horse crashes or unless my dad's just had like the world's unluckiest horse guided hunts in his life? Um, sorry, these dogs are going nuts. That's okay. Um, no, we've had some horse accidents, but because most clients 
don't listen or they think it's funny to scratch a horse on the butt with a stick. Why would that? <laughs> I don't know, but some people think it's a good idea to make them to go faster and half the time it doesn't work out well, but um, usually they're pretty good at staying together. We have some racks with like the, the pack saddle sliding and then the horses freak out on switchbacks and then we get into a little wreck, but um, a lot of the time it goes pretty well when everybody stays calm and just listens but okay my dad's yeah. had he uh didn't get bucked off but one time they found a bull i think they jumped a bull across the canyon and they're trying to like basically race it to the head of the canyon and uh cut it off so they could get a shot opportunity and so the guide grabbed his lead rope and took off through the black timber at like a I, dad said it was like all out. I'm guessing it probably wasn't all out if you asked the guide, but probably a fast gallop. Yeah. And he was, my dad was like, you know, trying to stay on and like get hit with the brush. Yeah. And um, I don't know what happened, but the I think he said the mule, like there's a, a down tree, like at an angle. And yeah. the guide was mule went around one way and his mule went around the other way and the tree hit him in the chest and like he just oh, went no. over backwards and landed on his feet but the you know obviously at that point it was too late the guy kept going and my brother like came up slowly with his mule because he couldn't ride that fast on his own through the black timber so he's just walking his mule behind him and so he hit, fell off that mule i think he fell off a different time but then the most notable is they're trying to walk their mules down a mountain and it was really steep you know that's why they're walking them yep. and he was grabbing onto the lead rope and he's like trying to go slow and it was it went down the guide went down and then to the left so my dad was trying to walk down and there's like one tree on the edge of like a little cliff and then after you know big enough it would have been a bad day and so he's looking at like how to do it and his mule just like hit him from in the back with his nose like hurry up yeah. and just launched him <laughs> and so he's like sliding down this this like little trail and he's like well if i catch that tree i should be safe but that's my plan and then all of a sudden like the rope got tight and the mule just stood there the whole time and, you know, didn't move. So the lead rope caught him and then he, you know, was able to like pull himself up the lead rope. Yeah. And then the guide came up. He's like, yeah, that, that way's not going to work. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, so he's just had pretty bad luck. And my brother has never liked horses, mules, anything that he has to ride. Yeah. And so I think that's probably why we don't do it anymore, to be honest. My, my brother doesn't like horses or mules much himself either <laughs> he, when he killed this bull out west he was like we took horses to go get the meat and everything and we're like okay we'll hop on he goes no brooke you can you can lead my horse i think i'll just walk i'm like okay so i ended up leading out his horse okay with weight like with the elk on it no he it was his riding horse oh, and sure. just decided not to ride it yeah, I met a guy in Montana that used to outfit, I think in Colorado, and he says, I'll never get on a horse again. He's like, I've had the worst luck with horses. I don't know if they were buying like $200 horses and then using them as, and then he's like, as the guide, we always got the worst horses. You know, yep. the, the client gets the best horses. He's like, yeah. I've been bitten so many times by horses and like bucked off. Like, it's just, he's just like, I'm never getting on a horse again. Yeah. I'm not, not the greatest rider myself at first either. I'm better at it now. I've had fallen off of a few taller horses a time or two, but I mean, that's what you get for being a guide. <laughs> yeah. So when you fall off, like, is there anything like, is it like something crazy's going on or like just something, it was just more of a fluke than anything? Um. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, what was the question? So when you, as a guide, when you fall off, obviously you like you are following the rules and you're not scratching your horse with a stick. So like, is it something crazy? Like you're trying to like run down an elk, or did just more of a fluke than anything? It's more of a fluke most of the time. Um, okay. Sometimes I'll be looking back at the string and my dog will come running by my horse and spook a little bit, and I'll just kind of fall off my saddle. Otherwise, I, I mean it's really nothing on their fault it's just kind of balance wise if you're looking at something like on another horse and something just randomly happens oh. really so it's so. usually just more embarrassing like you just hurt your feelings yeah yeah <laughs> when you're like looking at your client and then you fall off your horse and your client's like wow we got a great guide today yeah. folks <laughs> yeah. and like, like at one time i had a water bottle fall out of my pocket and it was kind of a 
like they don't like some mules don't like crumbly stuff and everything but i had a water bottle fall out on rocks and freaked her out and she took off running and that was through like a rock slide and there's a bunch of trees down whip my hat off on a branch and kind of just stuff like that and just random things falling out of pockets will spook them and people will fall off but yeah no one ever gets like too banged up falling off a horse um my first year we had one guy fall off a horse and he broke nine ribs and punctured a lung but we got him out and he was fine he actually i had a client last year and he was the one that recommended recommended him to come after he got hurt so so he got hurt and then told his buddy you should do it yeah and his buddy's like yeah sounds like a great time (laughs) well that's a good recommendation i mean he must have skipped that part Right. No, it's, it's pretty cool. So to have somebody get hurt on a, a mule and a horse and then continue to recommend us to take his buddies on hunts is pretty re- rewarding, if you ask me. Yeah, that is. I mean, I've always wanted to do the the full and then I would do it more of an experience, I think, especially the first time, not necessarily to get like a trophy tag or a trophy animal, but more so just like the experience of horseback riding up into the mountains to a wall tent, like a kilt cook tent camp whole nine yards and just the experience of like getting on a horse every day and going off hunting i think would be super fun i've always wanted to do it and my father-in-law like he said that's one of his like ultimate bucket list hunts is an elk hunt on horseback with an outfitter yeah no it's a lot of fun and it's really awesome to be able to see the amount of work that the mules put in for you you really start to appreciate what they do for everybody that uses them um and just even like new horses and mules that we get because we'll buy and sell horses and we'll use some to train them and then sell them the next year they come a long ways and it's really rewarding to see the work that they put in and then become a really good mule or horse that part that's tough for me i feel like if i was an outfitter i would want no part of testing out this new mule well i'm also trying to like guide these clients it's like nope I want the mule I've had for five years and I trust him with my life. <laughs> I don't want to be breaking mules while I'm trying to chase down some elk. I, I get yeah. it though. I mean, it's, it's part of the business, but I don't know. I feel like I'd be like, I'll bring my own meals. I'm good. I'm, Thank you. <laughs> I'm, the I'm the same way. I usually leave it up to the people that work with mules forever and I'll leave it to them. Most of the time we don't bring them into camp. We'll just leave them. We'll take them in and out and they'll take like salt blocks or oh. like four, four uh, bags of feed. So they realize that it's not hurting them. And if they buck, then it's going to hurt. But that's kind of how they learn is with pressure. But okay. So can you, when you ride a mule, like multiple days, I, I'm just kind of going off of horses and it's all from what that one cowboy said, but he's like, he had four horses and he was like, well, that one's lame at the moment. So I can't ride that one. This other one's kind of thin. I've been riding it a lot this summer. Like it, it's lost a lot of weight, like body weight. I don't really want to ride it too much more. And he was starting to kind of like get, he's like, I'm thin on horse right now. And I'm like, yeah. what does that mean? Like you have four of them. And so he's like, well, they're all, it's the end of the year. I've been riding them all yeah. One's hurt. Like, does that happen for you guys too? You got to like constantly be like swapping out meals and getting fresh yep. meals in. Yeah, that it happens quite often. That's why we're fortunate enough to have 70 plus meals. Um, either somebody will roll an ankle and get a, like a hot foot. So if it's hot, they got an injury in their ankle and we'll have to soak it in Epsom salt. We'll take them up to the sick pen is what we call it. Um, they'll get saddle sores. So you can't put a, a pad and a saddle on their back. Cause otherwise it oozes and it's just, it's just respect for the, the animal that does the work for you, really. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, you to want to take care. I mean, it's just like having a dog. Like, if like right. if my dog gets hurt, I don't bring him out hunting just to find more antlers or find more birds. Exactly. It's like, okay, well, he's dinged up. He's got to heal. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, and we'll, we'll swap out. Like, if I, I have one mule that I really enjoy riding, and if I'm riding 24-7 and I come out to bring new clients in, I'll leave him out for the week. Okay. So then so. do they get, does it take like a few weeks for them to recover and like get more energy or does that kind of done for the season? And like once, some, no, like how long does it take no. for a meal to kind of recover and regain that body fat and get back up to weight? 
Um, I would, depending on if they gain weight pretty easy, I'd say a week, but we don't normally use mules so much that we can't use them. We'll, mm. we have, mules, we'll take a set of mules, like 12 mules one day, and then everybody gets a break, and then we'll take a different 12 mules the next day, and then we'll, we'll just keep swapping them out. Gotcha. Yeah, and I mean, that's probably different. Like, this cowboy, he was working. Like, he, he rides to the top of the mountain, across the mountain, back down. Like, he's probably doing, like, solid riding versus, like, if you're hunting, like, you're maybe not walking as fast or as far. You're taking breaks. You're getting off. You're doing some on foot. Like, it's probably just a completely – and he's doing that day in, day out with only four all summer long. Right. And there's not yeah. great feed because it's always – it seems like every year it's a drought, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. I can see why he was struggling. But yeah, it was just a weird way to say he's like, yeah, I'm thin on horse. And I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, what do you mean? I don't get it. Yeah. So, but it does seem like there's a lot that goes into it. Definitely. I just feel like it doesn't make sense for anyone that's like from the Midwest does one Western hunt a year to like do horses unless you love horses and you're good with them. Like, but then right. it's probably like finding someplace out there to rent them from. Like, I don't know if it right. makes sense to bring your own cross country. Right. Right. I don't know. I, mean, I, I look at it in two different ways. Either horses are more work or they're not. Depends if you kill some. I mean, if you go into camp and you have horses, you get a ride in there. They get to carry all your stuff and then they get to bring your, your meat out and everything. But right. then you got to pack in a vet kit. You got to pack in their food, um, cob for weight gain, stuff like that. It's, it's everybody has their own preference. Yeah. I enjoy them both. Yeah, so. I think I would. I enjoy them both. I mean, I like riding horses. I've ridden them a couple times. I've always had a fun time, but it's, you know, a very controlled trail riding environment with, like, nice paths to walk. So it's different than hunting. Hunting, you want to go where, you know, the animals are, which is usually not where the trails are. But I yeah. really want to shed hunt on a horse. That, that yeah. to me, would be, like, the ultimate. Because, I'm as you can tell, I'm a big shed hunter. And I think yeah, for some yeah. reason, shed hunting on a horse just seems like the ultimate way to do it. That would be fun just to find a mountain glass and then ride the horse to go get it. Probably cover a lot more ground. Yeah, I'm thinking just, yeah, great areas that you know there's going to be antlers. You just go out horseback riding and you find a few. You, I don't know. They get a, Some horses can get a little spooky around like having antlers on their back too, though, right? So you got to make sure yeah. you got to. Yep. Maybe have like a bring two out, like you have your horse, and then if you find antlers, you put them on a like a pack horse, even though it's probably a light pack. It just seems yeah. like a great day. I don't know, ride yeah. around on a horse and find elk antlers. Heck yeah, that'd be my dream. But I don't have horses, and there's no elk in Minnesota. So, well, there's <laughs> like three bulls in Minnesota. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, no, that's the goal. I don't know. Yeah, the horse hunting. It's always been like a interest of mine. It's just it's a lot easier to do DIY hunts on a budget. <laughs> so, yeah. and it's, it's yeah. obviously, it's no f review on like the guide industry. Like everything you talked about is why it's not cheap. Like you're paying right. for the horse and the feed and the time and the cook, like all the materials and things right. going like it's, it just adds up. Like imagine trying to do that on your own. It would like right. take your entire, your salary to like get all that stuff. So. Yeah. Yep. But it is fun. I've learned a lot. I never thought I'd be doing this. I mean, I've wanted to do it since I was 14, but when I was a little girl, I never thought I'd be doing it. And my dad always told me, you'll be like your sisters and you won't hunt. You'll be done when you're a junior. And I'm like, whatever, dad. And now he's looking at me like you're the only one that ever carried it out into a career. So okay. it's pretty cool. Yeah, that does sound cool. So what does now that you're a guide, what does like hunting for yourself look like? I don't get to hunt very much on my own, honestly. Um, when I come home after the season, I usually make it home for opening rifle weekend, and I normally do some drives with my family. Um, I kind of now I feel like I just don't want to shoot anything because my brother and my dad are putting all the work for it, and I just don't feel right coming home and killing all the bucks that they worked for. So I'd like to watch them do it. Yeah, there's some of that. Um... Plus your guide, so like your job is to help other people. So maybe like it's just easy for that to carry on into other parts yeah. of your life too. Do yeah. you get to like is there ever a couple days in between groups where you would get to like maybe go out for like a day or an evening hunting out west? 
I could, yeah. If we tagged out early, I could. Um, it's just I don't have my own tag. I don't necessarily look into getting a tag because I usually dedicate my entire archery and rifle fall to guiding people. Yeah. And it, to me, it doesn't really make sense for me to spend whatever amount of money it is for non-residents to go and buy a tag if I am not guaranteed that time. Yeah, that would be a lot. I was picturing resident prices like if it was like 30 bucks for you to just have one in your pocket and then if you have like two days you're like well i could go out you know maybe i'm only looking for a cow or a you know a smaller bull or whatever you're looking for it's like i could shoot it i could get it out i could get it back to town and in a cooler and be ready for the next crew to come in you know two days from now or three days from now it could make sense but yeah non-resident prices yeah if if i was a resident i would totally consider it but um i'm not right now i've was thinking about it a while ago and just kind of never did it, I guess. Do you ever get tipped in, like, back straps? Mm, normally when we kill an elk, they're like, we're eating back strap tonight. And then... So you get to eat them. Yeah. yeah. So you get plenty of, like, fresh wild game. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. What is the cook... That's a good topic, though. What is the cooking like in camp? What kind of meals are cooked? Like, what do you have to work with? Are they doing everything in, like, a Dutch oven over a fire? Or is there... Um, it really depends on the cook that you have. So the cook that we had last year, she works on the river. She is what people would call a hippie. I don't know what the correct term is for that. But she works on the river, so she cooks on Dutch ovens a lot. Um, We are able to pack in an actual oven with propane tanks, so we did that. Um, she made everything a homemade, like the bread was homemade, her muffin, sourdough starter she had. So like cinnamon rolls she was making, um, she would actually bring potatoes up there. Otherwise it's kind of like box stuff, like, um, bagged potatoes and box salads kind of got to keep it light and easy for that week worth of hunting. But a lot of the time it, we have fresh elk meat because the company that I work for, they have an, uh, a meat shop also. So we get all the meat. So it's mainly elk that we eat and we'll have ribs, we'll have tri-tip, lasagna. And then the last day is kind of whatever, I think. Okay. I don't really have the uh, menu memorized, just kind of scattered, but. Well, yeah, by that of- time, you're probably like just in the rut, like doing yeah. chores and going to sl- trying to get as much sleep as you can. Yeah. But yeah, the meals that we get are definitely five star and it's hard to beat. That's why the horse hunting is really nice too. You get to carry whatever you want. Yeah, that is, that would be cool. I mean, that's the, that's the one, like the kicker that could make or break. I think an outfitting hunt is like, what kind of cook do you have in camp? Cause my brother has done both. They did a hunt in Colorado and the cook was also the only person that was doing like chores for the horses. And so like, and they had like one big, um, I think it was like a skillet. Like she cooked everything in that one thing on the fire. And so she'd like crack all the eggs, put them in there and then go out and do horse chores. And then when she got back, like the eggs were done, but they're like burnt, you know, like oh, no. hundred, the, everything they had was terrible. My brother threw in like a couple boxes of like cliff bars right before they left, just but yeah, road snacks or whatever. And like, yeah. that's what my dad and brother lived on for the week was like those. Oh things. no. Cause the cooking was just awful. But then they did another one with Jake Clark in Wyoming. I don't know if you know them. Um, it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. He's, he's, the way my brother explains it is he's like one of the premier, like five star outfitters in Wyoming. Gotcha. And so just, you know, different state, but he said like that cooking was phenomenal. Like my dad was like, would still talk about for hours, like the what that lady could do with that old, it was like a wood fire, wood stove. Like the old, like the ones they used to cook with in like the 1800s. Like everything she cooked was with that. And she's like, the, what she could do with that thing was insane. Like the temperature control and the time. And like, it was insane. Like it it was the best food I've ever had. And it, she did it all with, you know, pieces of pine. Right. So, yeah, really makes or breaks a hunt. 100%. I think that's what makes the fun, the hunt fun too, is being able to come back to camp and realizing that not everybody can have this opportunity in camp and have steaks and tri-tip and ribs. And I'll tell you, we sure don't in our out camp, we have spaghetti (laughs) and mac and cheese and like things that are easy to bring across the country. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's always the, 
fun thing when you have your little rocky talkie on there and you're calling the cook, hey, what's for dinner <laughs> when you're walking back? So, but it's pretty Does it, fun. It's pretty like routine though. Like, like the same couple of core meals will be in every group because I'm, I'm assuming it's yeah. like you ride in on Sundays and ride out on Saturdays or something like that. Yep. Yep. Okay. So they're all the, every week is basically the same. You just kind of mix it up. I mean, you could use pork and lasagna, or you could use elk, or you could yeah. you know switch it up. But but is she just so I would does she just like get a like a card from the boss or like a budget from the boss, and then she just goes out and gets the food she needs and gets a horse to bring it in for her and. Pretty much. I mean, so my boss and his wife will go do all the grocery shop shopping for the season for archery season and then yeah for each camp for each week grocery shopping and except for the produce obviously so then she'll go to the produce that she needs that day or before we go in so okay and is it solid like clients from archery kickoff through the end of the season or is there like any breaks or like off weeks or we have one off week and it's the first week in october because i believe they close archery season or all elk season and then they open it up i believe the like 7th or 8th of october both units and then they go start back up so that that's our one week off and then not really a week off for us because we got to pack in our other camp okay so you are so from the start of season you're basically sleeping in a tent until the end of season yep so if even if like if camp because so if you're a resident of wisconsin like you obviously don't have a house in Idaho. So what happens when you do like when like you guys do take out early and everyone leaves like two, three days early? You... My boss has a, a shed for all of his workers. And it's a just shed. like a That's... Yeah, it's just a <laughs> it is really a shed. It's where all of our It's kinda like, like a bunkhouse though. Like a yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. But I'm there I used to be there like nine months out of the year. So I have a house there right now and I'm subleasing it. Oh, um, I rent it. It's not my own personal house. So, I mean, it was after working with people 24 seven being spring and fishing boats and, uh, and then back into elk season, the last thing I want to do is come home and talk to seven more people. I want to go home and be by myself with my dog. So, yeah, no, that seems like a lot. So that's why I was just curious. Cause it, it seems like a busy fall being a guy, like just, always early mornings not really taking day like your days off are getting ready for your next group and like chores every day like it seems like it'd be great for the clients like they show up food's ready when they get back to camp chores are done go to bed or not I don't know what I mean I would assume some clients probably want to stay up and have a bonfire and you know throw around a flask and other clients are like I want as much sleep as possible because I'm here to kill a bull yeah and I feel like most most of the people that we work with uh are willing to accommodate all the clients. Like we had a group of clients who are like, Oh, let's stay up all night. I'm like, okay, I'll stay up till like 11 and then I'm going to bed. But yeah. Yeah. And I suppose like, I don't know, maybe you have a couple guides that are more of like the party animal and can just wake up with no sleep and they like stay up with them or not. Right. I suppose if your clients stay up all night and they don't want to hunt as early in the morning, it's you're like, well, it's your hunt. I mean, Right. You know what it, the consequences are. Like, we're not going to see much in the morning. Like, they're going to be bedded down by the time we get out there. And we'll just kind of be going in blind, you know, for lack of a better term, at 10 a.m. Right. Because we're not hearing bugles anymore. Or, you know, whatever. The, they're like, yeah, that's what we want to do. You know, we're just here to hang out. So, all right, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's normally how it goes. That sounds fun. So, off of guiding for the fall, um, obviously, it's winter now and the new year's in three days. So it's obviously all hunting seasons. They're basically coming to a close. Um, but I assume, are you doing the whole nine month, like summer fishing and then wrap that right into archery season again next year? Or what's the next year look like for you? Um, for right now, that's kind of what my idea is. I'm not really sure. It's always, it's always up in the air. I'm a loose cannon, <laughs> Yeah, but the, um, the, I stopped doing spring bear hunts two two seasons ago so i'll go into the fishing in march and then that goes till august and then usually i take three months and do the fall hunts and then winter time i kind of work online or bartend waitress help my family on the farm 
kind of work for the companies that I work for in Idaho. If I'm there, like I'll do preseason work on saddles and everything. Um, but that's basically what it's been for me the last four years. So awesome. That kind of sounds like a fun, probably seems stressful in the moment, but like yeah. a fun way where you can just be like, I don't know if I want to guide this year. Like maybe I'll do something else or maybe I will, or maybe I'll, you know, do more farm work or you just, it seems like you, you have a lot of freedom. Yeah. To it's choose a, what it's you a nice do. change of pace. I like a change of pace. Yeah. So awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, talking about, you know, life as a guide hunting with horses, the whole nine yards. Uh, I really appreciate it and hope that you have a successful year next year, no matter what you decide to do. But before we wrap up, uh, give people a chance to follow along with your adventures. I know you have a pretty packed Instagram full of all kinds of crazy reels that are like very entertaining to watch. It yeah. looks like you're pretty familiar with wrestling fish that look to be about three times your size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I try and do a lot of that social media type stuff, mainly because I get a lot of crap from clients and people that I work with as me being a young female guide and kind of wanting to push everybody else to get out there and go do what they actually want to do, even if it means being put down, but nobody's opinion really matters but yours. So, Well, yeah, it looks like, I mean, I was, I watched that. And I'm like, man, if I want to catch a big sturgeon in a river, I know who to call. Or, yeah. You know, if I want to like have a fun time on horseback, I know what to call. Like it looks like everyone that gives you crap is just I don't know. They should look yeah, in yeah. the mirror first, I suppose, would be the best way yeah. to put it. But but yeah. It, so yeah, give people where can they find you um or if and if you want to do a quick shout out to any of the businesses you're working with, feel free. Yeah. To. Well, my Instagram is my first and last name, Brooke, without an E, and then Danier, D-O-E-N-I-E-R, underscore zero, zero. Um, the company that we catch all the big fish is actually in Hell's Canyon, which is um, North America's biggest and deepest canyon. Um, that company is Kilgore Adventures. Um, give them a follow and check out all their reels. Call them up if you want to go on a jet boat ride. Um, they also do tours and then the hunting outfit is Hell's Canyon Outfitters. So also in Hell's Canyon. Yep. I've heard some wild stories about elk hunting in Hell's Canyon. Like I'm sure either one would be an epic adventure, whether you're on the river or in the hills. So Yeah. Cool. No, it, it's it's awesome. It's definitely a hard place to beat. So awesome. Well we'll put the links to all those places in the show notes for anyone to check out. And once again, thank you for being here today, Brooke, and thank you for listening, folks.